In this video, I'm going to talk about magical realism, which is a genre of literature and art, and I'll talk briefly about allegory. I'd like you to think about how both of these terms apply to the story of Very Old Man with Enormous Wings. Let's start by talking about magical realism. So this is the definition from the Norton Anthology, which is a really highly respected uh, literary anthology. Magical realism is a chiefly Latin American narrative strategy or storytelling strategy that's characterized by the matter of fact inclusion of fantastic or mythical elements into seemingly realistic fiction. So magical realism, just like the name suggests, incorporates both realism and the magical. Realism was a response to romanticism. If you've taken an art class or if you've taken a literature class, you might know a little bit about the romantic period. Realism was kind of a backlash to these idealized depictions of nature and humanity. So in realist paintings and in realist texts, we have gritty depictions of people who are living in poverty. We have really visceral depictions of uh, fruit rotting in a bowl or street life or uh, what it's like to walk around. Um, so realism is much more gritty. And of course, realism is connected to the invention of the camera. The magical uh, speaks for itself, but it's a little bit different than fantasy. So as, whereas in uh, fantasy novels, uh, oftentimes the magic is explained or justified, in magical realist texts, the magic tends to be incorporated in a very casual way. In fact, a lot of times the characters don't even seem surprised when something magical happens, when a character ascends into heaven or another character begins levitating or another character can convey emotions through through cooking. So it's this inclusion of magic uh, that might be surprising to the reader, but the characters just sort of take for granted. Or if they are surprised, they move on from that surprise really quickly. I think A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings captures this really beautifully because Palaio and Elisenda encounter an old man with gigantic wings. Now granted, he only has a couple of teeth and a few hairs and he's really dirty and he keeps flinging chicken poop everywhere, uh, but he has giant wings. So he could be sent by God, he could be an alien, uh, he could be a supernatural creature, but they get over their surprise really quickly and they move on very easily to uh, profiting off of him and also putting in him putting him in the chicken coop and making sure he's contained. Uh, at the end of the story, Elisenda is chopping onions while she watches him fly away. You can't get much more realistic and gritty than chopping up onions for dinner. And you also can't get much more magical and transcendent than seeing an old man with wings uh, fly above the horizon. So I think the story captures that really well. Even the old man's wings themselves, uh, they have stellar parasites. So on the one hand, they're very terrestrial and gritty, uh, but he also has parasites from another planet or from another solar system. Uh, perfectly captures magical realism. I want to provide a quote uh, by Salman Rushdie, who's another really important magical realist writer who wrote novels like Midnight's Children. If magic realism were just magic, it wouldn't matter. It would be mere whimsy, writing in which because anything can happen, nothing has effect. It's because the magic and magic realism has deep roots in the real, because it grows out of the real and illuminates it in beautiful and unexpected ways that it works. So I think what Rushdie is saying is that we need to focus on the real part of magical realism. This isn't just fantasy. Uh, it's magic rooted in gritty, everyday, mundane life. Uh, and that's what makes it have effect. That's what makes it really powerful to the reader. Even if the characters in the novel move on from the magical components really quickly, it can be really stunning to the reader uh, to encounter those magical or transcendent moments. So the, the real part of magical realism is really important. Unlike fantasy novels or sci-fi novels, in magical realism, the magic is not typically explained or justified. So even though it might be shocking or moving to the reader to read about something magical happening, the characters often react in a very nonchalant way, or if they are surprised, they move on from that surprise pretty quickly. 
Magical realist writers, many of them at least, come from countries that have been colonized. So you might notice that magical realist stories are often working on multiple levels. They can be critiquing um, exploitation, as in uh, Toni Morrison's critique of slavery. Uh, they can be critiquing uh, Western imperialism. Uh, they can be critiquing the Catholic Church. What I think is noteworthy and what, what makes magical realist texts so special is that they often combine several different cultures. It's this layering of indigenous cultures um, and uh, the culture of colonizers uh, that makes the text really rich with meaning and work on multiple levels. So in the same story, you might see references to mythology, to fairy tales, uh, to the Bible, um, all in one story. Many magical realist texts do not work in a linear way. They're not necessarily stories that work from beginning to middle to end. They can be cyclical uh, and they can be challenging to read. A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings is relatively linear though. As you're reading, you might also notice the carnivalesque. Uh, you might have heard of Carnival, which is a celebration um, in many Catholic countries in which people wear masks or dress up, and there's a suspension of the typical order and the typical way of things. Um, think about how that works in a story like A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings. I think when the troop arrives to town with uh, the spider woman who answers all of your questions, uh, who explains why she got turned into a spider, and has a very easy to digest and very easy to understand lesson. Don't disobey your parents, don't disobey authority, or you'll get turned into a spider. Um, that connects to the carnivalesque. The old man, though, on the other hand, he defies comprehension. He does not come with a clear and easy lesson. We don't know if he is a freak. We don't know if he is an alien or a Christ figure or a demon. We're left wondering what this old man actually represents or if he represents nothing but just himself, if he's not some sort of archetypal figure. So as you read, you might wanna compare and contrast the old man and how we're left with more questions than answers and we're left sort of unsettled and the spider woman who has the these easy to understand lessons. Um, also reflect on the subtitle of the story, A Tale for Children. I think most of us, once we've read it, we would say this is not a tale for children. The Spider Woman story, maybe, but the story as a whole is not a tale for children. Uh, and yet Marquez chose to give it that subtitle. I want to talk about allegory before we end the video. So many readers view this text as allegorical. That means that the characters represent themselves and something bigger than themselves. An allegory is a story, a poem, or a painting, or any sort of work of art in which the characters and events are symbols of something else. Allegories are often moral, religious, or political. So some examples include Animal Farm, or Plato's allegory of the cave. With allegory, writers are writing about something bigger through specific characters. Um, you might connect this idea of allegory back to what I said about post-colonial critiques or critiques of imperialism or critiques of power stru uh, structures or institutions like the Catholic Church uh, in the case of a very old man with enormous wings. Why might writers choose to critique something allegorically, so to do it indirectly, uh, rather than make those direct critiques. Because on the surface, many of these texts don't seem to be about uh, current political or contemporary political events, but many readers read them allegorically. So think about how this text might be an allegory. And like I said before, a lot of readers see the old man as a Christ figure or some sort of savior figure, although that is highly debatable. Uh, he represents many different things to many different people.